So, guys, before we get into this one, I've got a wee bit of an announcement for you. The author, Garbgo, of this All Skeleton Party is thinking about maybe starting, like, a comic series for it. However, with it being a comic series, it would be, like, a paid, like, you know, paid by the issue sort of thing. Like, over Patreon or whatever. We haven't really worked out the details to it all yet. But we just want to kind of get an idea of how many people would be interested in such a thing. So look guys, if you're interested in it, let us know in the comments down below. It's kind of hard to guess with this sort of thing, so the only way we've actually got any like idea of if this is even worth doing, is it something you guys would be interested in, you kind of need to tell us, you know, because we've got really no other way of finding tonight. But anyway, look, let's get into the story. Kept you long enough. Enjoy. After the Ardemans forces have fled the field, all that was left was to gather the skeletons up and deal with the sleepy slash drunken soldiers still left on the battlefield. Still smoking heavily from the bones, drunk and auspicious grab Furious and look around for their necromancer Kyla. Kyla is some yards away with Omen still heavily panting beside her. Yeah, if you could drag yourself over this way, that'd be great, Kyla calls out, pointing at the dead paladin still emitting holy aura and even in death causing damage to the skeletons. Chicken has found a nice spot to eat his lunch, and Rowdy is still chasing after him, trying to find where he went. Kyron now has found many a gold wedding ring, her little sack in her hand having a heavy jangle to it as she steps among the dead, finding a coin purse here and there. The Taliab pikemen have also advanced from the hole in the wall, and are now taking war trophies such as ears and scalps from the slain Argermans. Kyla begins to heal her skeletons with necromantic TLC, and the skeletons breathe out a sigh of relief as the radiant holy damage is ebbed away from their poor bones. Furious skeleton gives a jerk and slowly sits up, still mildly sizzling as his skull swivels back and forth. Did we win? Drunk hears a noise and turns around, seeing that the paladin's hammer seems to be powering up and glowing. What the... It detonates with a holy aura, a big one, but thankfully none of them were stupid enough to hang around the dead holy warrior so the dome of blinding light does none of them any harm. Kyla gives a bit of a sneezing fit, as if she had inhaled pollen. When the dome of holy energy dissipates, Auspicious gives a cry of anguish. He had suckered the paladin's soul energies into his torch, but when the hammer went off, it shortened out the torch and all the energy had dissipated, as if some foreign hand had snatched away the powerful souls inside. The fire was still there, though. Agile skeleton, as soon as the battle was obviously over, slung his rifle almost instantly and began to march his way towards the field hospital with Millie on his mind. Drunk remembers the very sleepy ogres and looked around, finding some grenades that Rowdy had dropped and holds them up, waggling unseen eyebrows as he gets a devious idea. Furious and auspicious are filled in on the idea and a test face needs done. Soldiers on the wall and those taking trophies watch curiously as the trio of skeletons huddled around a large ogre and are seen fussing about with its mouth. They then see the ogre almost waking up and drunk skeleton trying to hold his mouth open as the skeleton is tossed bodily to and fro as another skeleton is trying to hold something next to his lit torch. What are they doing? One soldier asks. As suddenly all the skeletons begin to sprint away and find cover while the ogre turns over onto his stomach and scratches at its ass. The resounding thump of detonation echoes through the battlefield as the upper half of this ogre simply disappears and a ragged lower half and a hole remains of the once sleeping ogre. The skeletons look up from their cover and glance at each other. Ogre lasagna, they say to each other and begin to stack and layer the ogres into order to make their grenades work to best effect. Soldiers pass money amongst themselves as to watch these skeletons drag and fuss with stacking ogres who are still fast asleep. All the soldiers pay attention when the skeletons make a run for cover again and see that they have daisy-chained fuses together. Oh holy shit, is heard from the wall before another concussion erupts from the battlefield and a red rain begins to descend from the heavens. Chunks of ogre and ogre morsels rain down from the sky and splat messily all over the skeletons who had this time stood proud behind their cover to admire their handiwork. Perfect cries drunk skeleton happily and places his hands on his bony hips as a lower intestine hangs sloppily from his skull. Kyla stared on, hiding her emotions for one reason and another as Omen shrieks and flails, 
trying to get the ogre bits out of her hair and off her body. Rowdy finds chicken, and the velociraptor has been hard at work getting his HP back with lunch. Large portions of the mistress of flesh are missing. Her innards laying splayed in the road like a buffet for the crows. Soldiers march past and poke her face as they go, knowing just who that foul abomination belongs to. Rowdy runs up and holds out his hand, shouting at Chicken. Chicken clicks at him and wags his great feathery tail happily, tilting his reptilian bird head. Rowdy realises now that Chicken doesn't know language all that well except for auspicious and does his best to try and pantomime that he wants the daggers still clutched in the sopping wet hands of the mistress. Chicken is confused and leans down, ripping off a chunk of thigh meat and plopping it in Rowdy's hands. Rowdy isn't happy about this and throws it down in frustration, in which Chicken feels insulted that Rowdy would throw down such a prime cut of meat freely given. Chicken growls and turns his back to Rowdy going back to chomping down on his meal, tearing away at her stomach and hips. Rowdy sneakily slinks over and manages to whisk away with both of the knives, giving them a twirl. One of them looks like a regular curvy knife, while the other looks... uh, greasy. Rowdy rubs the knife with his thumb, and it's still greasy no matter what he does. Huh. Walking back towards the other skeletons, he sees a soldier standing idle. A young boy who looks more like a jeweller's son from how soft his face and hands are. Hey, you, can you help me out? Sure, sure, the boy says, hopping up and running over. Rowdy holds the non-greasy knife. I'm going to poke you with this. I want you to tell me what you feel when I do. The lad is weirded the fuck out, but is convinced that this is helping, somehow. Rowdy pokes him on the knuckles with the knife. The lad doesn't react at first, but an, ow, yo, before he feels a con save. The very bones of his body react violently and his body is filled with so much savage pain that he falls backwards unconscious, cracking his head on the ground. Oh, hey, help! This soldier has passed out! Help! Rowdy screams, looking around while tucking both the knives into his belt and hiding them with his armour. A pair of soldiers walk up and one of them coos out. Oh, the poor lad must be exhausted from the battle. Hey, Georgie, let's take him to the hospital, eh? and the two of them pick up and carry him away. When they are well away, Rowdy takes out the greasy knife and gives himself a poke with it. Nothing happens, so he shrugs and puts it back in his belt. He sees ahead that the grip minus Agile is reforming and jogs away to join them. At the field hospital, Agile finds out that Millie was stabilised and moved to the hospital proper and runs down the location of where she is. Millie is near the back, Agile having to walk amongst the beds of those others who have lost limbs. Ranks upon ranks of soldiers lay in beds, missing hands, legs, arms, a few civilians here and there. But no other young adults besides Millie. There's a chair beside the bed where Millie lay, her head on a pillow and a small bottle beside her bed. Judging from how loudly Millie is snoring, Agile figures it must be some kind of painkiller or sleeping agent. He also sees that her wound has been well wrapped and treated, but a bit messy. The skeleton flags down a nurse, who strides over and cleans away the old bandages. If Agile could have blanched, he would have. They had to go in and cut away more of the leg wound, in order to make sure it was well cleaned and even, and they had now bound it to heal, and the scar foretold of a healer having come in and sealed the wound magically. Millie lay there snoring, her hands clutched her hospital clothes, and Agile looked down at her as sadly as a skeleton could. He relayed to the group that he was staying with Millie, and leaned back in the chair that was next to her bed. There he sat, unmoving, on guard for Millie. He says he's staying with Millie, reports drunk, nodding at Kyla. Meanwhile, First has chicken. Rowdy had told First to find him something to stab, and some minutes ago, the knoll went running off into town. Now, First had a chicken. Where did you find that? Rowdy starts, looking around for guards. In front of house. Did you at least ask First? No, You ask first to find chicken, first says, shaking the little animal in her meaty paw by the neck. The two exchange a few more words before Rowdy finally takes the chicken, as first pins her ears. Rowdy tell first to find something stab, ask first if first ask first, riddle riddles. She growls and crosses her arms. Rowdy looks at her sassily, then pokes the chicken with the greasy dagger. First's angry ears turn to fear ears as the chicken gives a short screech before bleeding from every orifice and duct available in that body. Holy shit, what the fuck is that? Why are you holding it? 
screeches Kyla, and all the living members recoil away from the scene as Rowdy drops the chicken into the puddle of its own original recipe. Oh, God. I I took it from the dead lady. I, he says, before realising he's still holding it and wrapping it up in cloth, leather, and stuffing it down into his rucksack. The skeletons turn into bait, chucking the dagger into the harbour when a crunching sound is heard. Skeletons turn back around to see chicken, eating the chicken. Ah! Yaws auspicious, and he launches forward. Give it to me, spit it out, stop, fucking chew! Auspicious has to reach arm's length into chicken's throat in order to pull out the bled out file, and rips it out with a wet slurp and throwing the chicken away. Then has to strangle hold chicken to make sure he couldn't run after it. Meat, my food! Chicken cries out to Auspicious' brain. And the Velocity chicken churs sadly. It's poisoned, you idiot. My food! Time warped to the next morning. Skeletons are milling about the inn during the breakfast hours. Auspicious and Chicken head off to get some armour made for the raptor. The little fox familiar trotting behind them as the living members sit down to have breakfast. Harla, Omen and Kyla all take a standard breakfast of whole grains and meats. While first seem to just want beer and meat gnawing idly at a leg of something that apparently tastes delicious. Furious sees this and decides it's time to scoot. As Drunk and Rowdy take a seat with the party, Rowdy having a cup of coffee and drunk with his tankard and a bowl of cereal. As Furious is leaving the building, he sees an official-looking gentleman striding towards the inn with a retinue of people, but doesn't want anything to do with it and slides past into the street. He's quite portly and cheery-faced, waving to people who look at him and generally acting quite friendly. Ah, hello there! Oh, wait, okay. The man splutters as Furious slips on by, his bones rattling as he resolutely steps away. Straightening his vest and clearing his throat, the gentleman regains his composure and steps forward towards the door of the inn, opening it and stepping inside while his people filter in behind him. It is quite apparent who his target is and walks towards the table. Kyla is staring at her skeletons as she's trying to eat her oatmeal, staring at them with slitted eyes as they mock, drink and eat, making a mess on the floor. Ah, there you are, the man exclaims. I assume you are the skeletons and necromancer from a few days ago, the ones that helped break the siege. Rowdy Skeleton holds his coffee up, pinky out, and looks at the gentleman. Who wants to know? Drunk Skeleton also stares, messily crunching his cereal in his jaws and the milk falling to the floor below. (laughs) Well, you see, I control this city, he says, standing proudly. So you're like a king? Rowdy asks. I wouldn't say a king. I'd say like a very powerful mayor of sorts. Sounds like a king with extra steps, Drunk says, chomping loudly. (laughs) Sure, why not? Now, which one of you is in charge? The gentleman asks, pointing a finger at the table. Harla and Omen sniff and sit back. While Rowdy goes, well, I don't want to tip my own horn. Drunk smacks him on the shoulder and then points his spoon at Kyla. Yeah, I'm in charge of these idiots. How can I help you? Kyla groans out and flicks her extra silverware at Rowdy, who dodges it and rattles at her. Excellent, excellent, he says, and sits down next to Kyla, snagging an extra chair. I felt that you guys deserved a kind of reward after hearing what you guys did and what happened to your poor little friend who lost the leg. The skeletons murmur in agreement while Kyla lightly waves her hand at them to quiet them. So, there's no good way to really reward these kinds of actions. So I decided to take a little initiative and visit the market guild here in the city. And kind of give you a blank check, so to speak. Everyone agreed to either give you charity or at least a hefty discount on anything you may need. I mean, how do you really reward dead people? Besides simple money. Money is so lacking in character and place. I decided to do something with a little more flair. Earlier, while standing guard over Millie at the hospital, Millie awakens from her rest and groans, looking around and seeing the stoic skeleton sitting next to her bedside. Mr. Agile, she murmurs, and reaches up, giving his rifle sling a tug. Agile snaps out of his daydreaming and looks down, placing a hand over Millie's. He checks in on how she's doing, and then fetches a nurse to get her leg checked out and a few other vital things looked over. Millie makes it quite apparent she wants to leave while the nurse checks her pulse and frowns as the nurse checks her eyes, quite annoyed by having someone's finger in her eyeball. She's finally given the okay to leave and she happily swings her leg over the side of the bed. There is, however, a pause 
As she looks down and sees that not everything is in equal measure, Millie's face contorts for a moment as she stares down, angry at her leg. If I had just stayed put, she murmurs and wiggles her ghost toes, her thigh muscles flexing with emotion. It was very brave though, what you did. I mean, um, not every little girl has the brass coconuts to run up on a wall. You know, mid-siege just to hand out supplies. Agel says quickly, trying to distract Millie. He goes on for a bit and finally manages to get Millie to crack a smile before she cuts him off for a moment. Who was the woman? The big, really big lady? I heard laughing and only saw her for a split moment. Agile Skeleton wrings his bony hands for a moment before telling her about his chosen deity and what she did to make sure they survived the fall. Millie furrows her brows for a second when Agile tells her she doesn't have a mouth but takes all the information in stride. Figuratively, anyway. Millie looks at Agile, her voice quiet. Can we leave? Agile tilts his head but his gaze catches hers and sees that she's looking at the other people in the hospital, many of them also missing limbs and other grievous injuries. The skeleton pops up and skips Millie into his arms, holding her close as he begins to walk away. The nurse looks up and goffs as Agile is already halfway across the ward. Wait, wait, you bonehead, you need these! She bellows and Agile turns to see her holding a pair of crutches. Millie and Agile look at each other before Agile has to sheepishly walk over to let Millie take her crutches, holding them to her chest. Let's get you some actual breakfast, I think, says Agile, and they both walk out into the sun. A few minutes pass as the two make their way down towards the inn, when a shadow swallows them as if something blocks the sun. Both of them look up and see a bona fide pocket frigate coasting across the sky, held aloft by a great gas envelope. Millie cries out in excitement at the sight of the big ship as Agile's bottom jaw thunks against his armour from how low it's hanging. Look at it! It's an airship! Millie squeals and sits up as best she can in Agile's arms. Do you think we can see it later? Agile Skeleton looks down at the happy Millie and smiles on the inside. Of course we can, my little possum, but first, food. Flaming skeleton and brave girl in the house! Agile bellows and strides up with a big bone energy, causing the scribes and other members of the gentleman's retinue to part. Agile had walked up in time to hear what was being said inside, and decided to make an entrance. They know who he is, and part quickly. Rowdy gestures to Agile. This is our intern. Oh fuck off, cunt, I'm the iconic member of this outfit. Agile growls back, pointing at him with a hand from under Millie. Rowdy holds up his hands. Oh yeah, real easy to be iconic when you burn the literal candle at both ends. Drunk Skeleton pipes up. He's actually the main caretaker for our friend. He also likes tubes that shoot out explodey things. Agile gives his back a wiggle, his rifle a rattling. I do like my boomsticks. The gentleman laughs. Ah yes, dad told me all about you. Your dad? Agile asks. Yes, and he said you were having a lover's quarrel with this one. And the gentleman points at Rowdy. Rowdy slams down his hand. We are strictly professional in nature. What, are you dating now? Asks Millie, confused as fuck. Both skeletons begin yelling at each other and at the gentleman, who laughs and holds up his hands in front of him in self-defence. After everyone quiets down, the man explains again that whatever the party needs, the city will try and provide, though he cannot help them with his dad, after all, and chuckles after he says that. Skeletons all hmm at each other, and Rowdy lifts his coffee cup to his lips, spattering coffee all down his chest and seat, then smacking his lips thoughtfully. A thud is heard, as Kyla exasperately thumps her head on the table. The gentleman chuckles, answers a few more questions as Agile and Rowdy begin arguing again over the rifle Rowdy stole, and then bids his goodbye, walking away from the domestic altercation. Millie is given a seat to sit in, as well as some food, and she happily ruffles First's ears. Usually First doesn't abide this, but due to Millie's leg, she lets it slide, for now, cheering angrily. Harla looks down at her daughter as she sets down her teacup and nudges her, Kyla's head rolling on the table. Kyla, darling, why don't you tell them what we were discussing earlier before breakfast? Nah! Kyla groans and lifts her head, hair stuck to her face from embarrassed sweating due to her skeleton's acting, as they always do. Right, right. Kyla explains to the skeletons in front of her that they want to go home. Home? Onilands? Drunk says, leaning forward harshly and shuddering the table. 
causing Omen and Millie scrabbling for their cups as they tilt ominously. Yes, home. Mama explained to me that we should go home. And also, she growls, looking up at her mum, who flexes her arm menacingly, said that I need to let you guys do it because I've been telling you what to do too much. She bites off the last part, and Harla eyes her threateningly while still holding a soft smile. What? All the skeletons say at once. Harla speaks up this time. After all, you've shown yourselves to be completely competent, and, well, should be able to plan this all on your own. That's not what we dis- Kyla erupts, rounding on her mother. But before she can get anything else out, Harla whips out her arm and hugs the necromancer to her bosom. She is so proud of what you guys have done, and really, really wants you guys to plan our route home after you go and buy supplies. Kyla screeches from under her mother's arm and chest flesh, scrabbling and kicking, but her mother is fucking strong, bro. Now, now, no time to waste, Harla chirps happily, and with her free hand bids the skeletons to go. Kyla is throwing how she really feels into the skulls of the skeletons, who are choking back laughter from the abuse as Millie and Omen stare on wide-eyed, slowly spinning food into their mouths. They, however, take the hint, and begin to leave the inn to venture out into the markets of Talayab and take advantage of their free pass in the town. To sum up their mental link, it's more or less a long, drawn out, angry, furious, necromantic. <laughs> the skeletons lose their shit out in the street, hooting with laughter. Necromilf has a sense of humour, roars drunk, and they all separate after. Rowdy decides he wants to get a very secure sheath for the death knife made and tucks it, plus the box it's in, inside his ribcage and sets off to find a leather worker. His first target is Gertrude's simple leathers and walks in, the bell in the door tingling as he steps through. Well, hello there, young man, says an older woman, clearly well past retirement age, her hands shaking slightly as she works on a small pattern on her workboard. For some reason, Rowdy thinks this is the perfect person to ask, Rowdy explains to her that this knife is very dangerous, but would like a leather sheath made for it with clasps so it can't fall out. Gertrude, the sweet old woman, agrees and asks Rowdy to place the knife on a leather blank. Her hands bobbing with her tremors, she begins to trace the blade with a little oil pen, rounding along the edges to get a good print. Rowdy flinches as Gertrude goes, Oh, sharp it is indeed. Her finger is bleeding. Oh, no! <laughs> Rowdy bellows and leaps forward to help as the woman begins to convulse. He first thinks to burn his favour, but instead of beseeching the gods, Hold on, I'll check my rucksack! He screams as the woman begins to screech, blood pouring out of her eyes, ears, nose, mouth and elsewhere. As Rowdy leans down to rummage in his pack, he hears a thud. Slowly rising, Rowdy leans up and peeks over the top of the workbench. Uh, Gertrude? He whispers and rises a little more to see Gertrude has retired, permanently. With a flash, Rowdy shoves the knife back into its safety box, slams it inside his ribcage, shoulders his bag, snatches the outline, and books it out of the store, the bell tinkling as he runs out. Rowdy takes a moment to regain his bearings, and goes down the road to Andy's hiding tail, walking past the door. The man working behind the counter sees Rowdy and waves. Hey there! I was told you may make an appearance. How can I help you? The skeleton holds up his hand to stop him. How old are you and how fine are your hands? Um, I'm about 45 year old and my hands are okay. The man chuckles nervously. Rowdy explains what he needs again and lays down the outline. Oh, this looks like one of Gertrude's outlines with how shaky it is. Should really have retired years ago. Far, far too old to be working. Ought to stop by and see how she's doing. He chuckles and holds up the pattern. Good thing you came here though. That knife is super dangerous by the sounds of it. Why don't you take a look at the wall for a steel scabbard and bring it over here. Rowdy finds one that kind of matches with the knife, having pulled it out by the wall to ghost fit, and finds one he likes, with buckles for the hilt, a cavalry sheath. He then turns around and sees the man is wearing extremely thick leather armour and is standing against the wall. How does it fit? He shouts, muffled by his helmet. Rowdy slides it in, it's a little wiggly. Any way to kind of tighten it up? Yep, just uh, throw me the sheath. You hold the knife, he replies. Rowdy tosses him the sheath. Good, now stay there and keep that fucking thing away from me. 
You see, Rowdy had been a bit more adamant on just what the knife did, but lied, saying it made you burst into flames so his crime would be covered up. After a bit of tinkering with the sheath, Andy throws it back to Rowdy, and it fits snugly. Good to hear, now get that thing out of my store. Rowdy exits the store, dagger in sheath, sheath in box, box in ribcage, and walks out onto the road, and he sees Drunk there, waving at him and running over to him to go get some armour made together. Rowdy is, however, body checked by a sailor who didn't see him, and as the sailor apologises, the box in his ribcage, by bad luck, flies out into the air, oh god, and smashes down onto the road. The death knife in its metal sheath skitters across the cobbles. Ah! Rowdy screeches in absolute panic, scrabbling on all fours after the knife. Drunk Skelton stands there. What are you doing? Death knife! Death knife! Rowdy yells again to him via necroscope, and Drunk sees the sheath get kicked by a passerby's foot and flies between his feet. Oh no, he groans and spins, leaping after it. Yakety sax plays loudly. <laughs> after a few successful rolls, both skeletons manage to corral the knife and tie it snugly to the bones of Rowdy's ribcage, before double tying it and then tightening down the armour straps. Drunk decides he wants metal armour, and heads off to the blacksmith's. Rowdy sighs and sees another leather worker. Gone Burrow's leather works. He walks in, and the first thing he sees is a very cute woman working at her work desk, deftly sewing a leather mask while humming. She looks up and smiles. Oh, it's one of you, how lovely. Rowdy doesn't hear this, as the room spins around him. She's the leather worker, all right. All along the walls are rows and rows of fetish wear. Oh, God! (laughs) Gimp masks, ball gags, strap-ons, chastity belts, full-body leather suits, leather whips, leather leg shackles, leather body harnesses, corsets, stiletto boots of all sizes, thigh-high boots, animal teal butt plugs. It's all there. I don't know what Garbro's into putting an animal teal (laughs) butt plugs into this, but okay. (laughs) I uh, Rowdy says, backing away towards the door. But the woman catches his hand. Oh, come on now, you've just walked in. And pulls him inside, the door closing behind him. Oh, Jesus, what's going on? Oh, God. <laughs> Rowdy recovers long enough to say he needs armour. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't tell me he gets, like, full-on gift yeah, set for armour. <laughs> they should have given it to Agile. This is at the point I would take out the fucking knife. <laughs> yeah. She says she knows just the thing and leads Rowdy to a very normal looking suit of leather in the corner, along with a few more normal things, such as a face mask. There's also a leather gimp suit next to it, with only a hole for the mouth, and Rowdy blanches as best as a skeleton can. Rowdy breathes out in relief, and says that armour will do fine, (laughs) but that he wants a few certain custom things done to it. You want a door to access your ribcage? She says, crossing her arms, and the skeleton pokes his fingertips together. Wish I could say that was the weirdest thing I've been asked, but it's a little bit of a custom job and will take maybe a day or two. And while the king said it was free, I'm going to have to charge you a little for my time. Rowdy agrees, then also pays for a face mask that she offered. And they both shop for a moment to figure out exactly what he wants, which is something that covers his face and mouth, is artistic, and only allows his eye sockets to show. They finger gun at each other, and she giggles happily. I'll see you soon, she says, and drags the armour to her workbench. Rowdy turns to leave, and sees the wall with the door is top to bottom with whips, many of which have phalluses for the handle. Rowdy's bits squeak as he skitters to a stop, then continues on, pretending to ignore what he saw as he exits. Drunk links up with Rowdy again, and both of them make their way to Mad Jack's the hatter. Drunk asks Rowdy about the leather shopping, but Rowdy is reluctant to say anything, clamming up immediately. Drunk skeleton is curious, but doesn't pry. The two find Mad Jack, and after wrestling with the mercury-addled mind of a hatter, make off with a bright blue Jojo type hat, and a large red cardinal hat. Allah, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition! (laughs) Both don their hats immediately, and move on to the potion store. A young girl is working the counter, and once she sees both of the skeletons, she pulls down her pigtails, clutching them to her cheeks. Oh no, not you two! I thought I was safe! 
Potion seller, begins Drunk. I'm going into battle, follows Rowdy, striking a pose. Drunk Skeleton runs a hand along the edge of his stupid hat. And I need your strongest potions, he roars, pointing a finger at her with a flourish. Ugh, the young girl groans, and tries to hide behind the counter. The two skeletons level out after that, and purchase stuff for their living compatriots. Drunk buying a field surgeon's kit and some books on the subject to read. Over his shoulder, he hears the young woman yelling at Rowdy. There is no such thing as a bone healing juice, you idiot. It's no shock the person dumb enough to test a knife on my brother is the same moron who thinks bone juice is real. Drunk laughs as Rowdy rattles at her. They make way with their purchases and the girl purses her lips. All purchases are on the house, she murmurs placing a small jar on the counter, but tips are appreciated. Rowdy tips her copper, in which it then pings off his skull as she whips it back into his face. Drunk likes her fire and tips her silver. See? He knows how to treat a woman. Oh, 